So first of all, <laughs> thanks a lot for inviting me and for organizing this. It's such a great conference. And not only have I enjoyed all the talks, but also I think I've learned some things or had some ideas that are going to be relevant for this project specifically, because it's still work in progress. So it's um, joint work with Sean Mazumter, who is a graduate student at Harvard Government, and with Marco Tabellini, who was just on the job market from MIT Econ. Um, and I'll start with our specific motivation for writing this paper. This was on the study of immigration and immigrant assimilation specifically. So what we are interested in is understanding how immigrants come to become part of a majority group. And that's something that has been studied a lot from different angles by sociologists, economists. A lot of the work in economics specifically has focused on either measuring assimilation in some way or looking at the effects that specific policies or interventions have on assimilation. Um, and what we were interested in here is more of a sociological process of group interaction. So uh, we think that much of this, uh, an immigrant group becoming part of the majority happens when new immigrant groups appear. Um, and through a variety of mechanisms, they lead older immigrant groups to assimilate, and I'll explain what those are. Um, but the reason why we're actually studying immigration in the first place is because we are interested in group boundaries and group identity, and we think that immigration is a very good context in which to, to, to study this changing group identity and group boundaries. So while this is a very specific application, we think that it might be of interest uh, more generally, it might be informative for how uh, in-groups come to form and potentially to expand so as to incorporate previous out-groups. So we think that's relevant to that. And then there is a, a sort of more specific historical question that we're trying to answer that has to do with immigration and immigrant integration in the US. So the US is generally considered a country, at least compared to other countries uh, in Europe, that is good at integrating immigrants. And so to be American is something that is much more defined on the basis of common values than on the basis of birthplace, as is the case in many European countries. At the same time, the US has this very uh, large and salient minority that is African Americans, and so whether this division on the basis of race defined as skin color plays a role for how easy it was for immigrants to integrate historically and potentially still today um, is a question. We're not the first to ask this question. Um, historians and sociologists have asked it before, uh, but we offer quantitative and also causal evidence that race may have played a role. Um, so how are we answering those questions? We are focusing on a specific historical context that is the first great migration. Um, this was the first time that African Americans moved out of the South and into Northern industrializing urban centers uh, during and after the First World War. And they moved in large numbers. Uh, until then, there wasn't a very large population of blacks in the North. Um, and so the question that we ask in this context is, how do black inflows to the North affect assimilation? And we can talk about the definition of this term. For us, it's very, we just measure it as immigrants becoming more similar to the native Anglo-Saxon white majority. And so how is assimilation affected? Just to preview um, our results, we do find that this helps immigrants assimilate. Um, and then we're going to try and investigate through what channels that happens. Um, and we think that, um, Something that seems to be happening is that essentially the perceptions of native whites towards immigrants change and they tend to view them as closer to them once a new outgroup that is more salient arrives. And then at the same time, immigrants themselves respond in some way. So immigrants were anyways trying to fit in uh, in some way or the other, not everybody exerting the same effort, but they did exert some sort of assimilation effort. And once they see that barriers to assimilation are lower because of the appearance of African Americans that now become the new threat, um, then some immigrant groups, not all of them, are going to exert more effort to become uh, like native whites or to become Americans. So that's in a nutshell the mechanism that we have in mind and we can provide some empirical evidence on. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on the related literature. There's obviously a big literature on group identity, though I should say at this point that we don't measure identity as identification or as a belief. We really measure it in terms of observable outcomes. Uh, so we're talking about assimilation throughout the paper and not about identity so much. We're just observing how much more similar immigrants become to natives. Uh, we don't know how they feel about it. So we have some measures that we could potentially be proxies of that, but not perfect proxies. 
Um, in any case, the one thing that I wanted to emphasize, even though this is essentially um, almost entirely an empirical paper, um, we do think that there are some interesting things that come out of it potentially for theory, especially for some of the models of cultural transmission that are workhorse models in economics at least, so the model of Bizin and Verdier, um, that look at the dynamics of traits over time and usually look at two groups, a majority and a minority. So in our case, what we highlight is that there can be multiple minorities and the interactions between these minorities and the majority may have interesting implications with what happens uh, for culture over time. Okay. So let me give you um, uh, some uh, context, historical background on uh, the period that we're studying. So the first Great Migration starts um, during the First World War uh, and lasts essentially until 1930. Um, this was, as I said, the first time that blacks move en masse to the north. Um, and so this period sees about one and a half million African Americans move um, outside the south. This is not the largest wave of migration. There is a second wave that happens after the Second World War and lasts well into the 1960s and 70s. But for our purposes, um, this is interesting and important because we're looking at the first time this group appears. And so this is, this is of more importance for us and for our setup than the sheer numbers. Um, so the share of blacks that, who live in the north rises from 10 to 25% during this period. Um, the migration was motivated by a combination of push and pull factors. Um, the main pull factor in the north was essentially the war and industrialization. So uh, a lot of new jobs are created in manufacturing, requiring very low levels of skills so they can be filled by African Americans. Um, at the same time, the South during this period was not doing very well. So the entire period in the late 19th century and until 1920s was the period that saw um, the, the political climate for African Americans. Um, this was the period that led to their uh, almost complete disenfranchisement. Uh, there was a lot of racial violence and lynching. At the same time, the economy of the South was not doing that well, especially the agricultural sector. Um, there were uh, various negative shocks to agriculture, such as the boll weevil infestation during the 19th century that affects cotton crops, um, uh, a great Mississippi flood in the 20s. So this is a sector in uh, agriculture is the sector in which most African Americans are employed, so they're negatively affected. This drives them to leave. Uh, where do they go? This is a figure from uh, the website of the census that essentially shows that um, the dots are changes in the share of blacks and you can see that a lot of them still move within the south and there is a lot of movement from uh, say the deep south to the border south but a lot of them also move um, to the urban northeast and midwest so the big cities in, in, in this area the largest urban centers like New York, Chicago, Detroit, uh, Philadelphia, all those places um, uh, are basically the places where blacks move to and the places that we will be using in our empirical analysis. Um, and uh, though I should say that still during this period, most blacks still live in the South. Um, and this is just what I, show, I mentioned before. This is just the share of blacks who live in the North uh, and how it rises from about 10% in 1900 to around 25% in 1930. Now what's interesting in these migration patterns and for us is useful because we're going to take advantage of it in our empirical uh, um, strategy is that you not know, just in the case of the black migration during this period, but with migrations in general, there is a sort of predictability as to where immigrants go. Um, and this can be predicted by where their compatriots have gone before. So settlement patterns are persistent and one can use that uh, because to, that ex to some extent this persistence um, can be disentangled by other factors that are more economic in nature that are attracting immigrants. Uh, so this is just a graph that shows that. Um, this is showing the share of blacks born in three southern states, Alabama, Florida, and Mississippi, who move out of the south. Um, by northern city or metropolitan statistical area, this is the unit of analysis we're going to be using, uh, in which they settle. So you can see that 40% of African Americans who were born in Florida and leave the south move to, the, to New York City, and 40% or a bit more even than 40% of African Americans who were born in Mississippi and leave the south move um, to St. Louis, Missouri. So. This is just to keep in mind because this is what we use um, later on in our empirics. Um, at the same time, um, as blacks move to the north, 
they start like this is what we're going to be studying their interaction with immigrants who had been arriving there uh, during the last 50 or so years so this is the era of mass migration there were no restrictions to immigration in the u.s until the uh, early 20s essentially when um, the system of quotas was imposed uh, about 50 million people leave europe during that time 30 million uh, move to the u.s um, and what's interesting and kind of relevant um, is that the composition of immigrants changes a lot during this period from 1850 to 1920. So while in the mid 19th century, most of them come from Western and Northern Europe, Germany, the UK, uh, in the late 19th century and in the early 20th century, a lot of people from Southern and Eastern Europe start arriving. And it is those immigrants that start causing concerns and trigger a sort of nativist climate that kind of seems very similar to what is happening today. Um, to some extent, uh, you know, these immigrants had a profile that seemed less assimilable. They tended to be male, uh, to be uneducated. Um, a lot of them illiterate, did not speak English. A lot of them did not plan to live in the US or to settle there forever. They just wanted to work there for a few years and return um, to their country of origin. Um, so this is, a, this is the group of immigrants that um, causes a lot of concern um, and a lot of that concern is not so much economic in nature as it is cultural so there is a worry that these immigrants are very culturally distant from Americans and they're never going to assimilate and this was also a period in which and I'm going to go through these quotes um, in which um, racism was sort of uh, a legitimate field of study, so uh, scientific racism and, and scientific uh, racist scientists were behind the engineering of the system of quotas that essentially ended this era of mass migration to the US. Uh, so this was a period in which uh, Madison Grant wrote his book The Passing of the Great Race, the great race being the Nordic race uh, to which Anglo-Saxons belonged. Um, and it's called the passing of the great race because the Nordics are seeing themselves threatened now in the US by the arrival of new immigrants from the other two inferior in every way races of the Alpines and Mediterraneans that are essentially Southern Europeans, uh, Slavs, uh, Eastern European Jews. And so these are just some quotes of academics of the time. The first one is Irving Fisher, who was a famous statistician and economist. Um, he was one of the founders, I think, of the American Eugenics Committee. Um, and he was given a talk in which he said that as an economist he would be, should be in favor of free immigration, but at the same time uh, immigration, the core of the problem of immigration is one of race and eugenics and that deeply worried him. And the second one is from Francis Walker who was the president of the MIT for 10 years and he said that we need to protect the American standard of living and the quality of American citizenship from degradation through the tumultuous axis of vast throngs of ignorant and brutalized peasantry from the countries of Eastern and Southern Europe. And the latter quote is not from an academic, it's from a congressman um, of Alabama. Um, but it's interesting because uh, it relates to what we're studying here, the fact that those immigrants were perceiv perceived as different, not just in terms of culture, but also in terms of color, skin tone. So he says that the color of thousands of them, meaning Mediterranean Slavs and Jews, differs materially from that of the Anglo-Saxons. And so the story that we're telling here is that this changes uh, once African Americans arrive. All of these people start being white, and this has been documented by the historical literature as well. Okay, so I'm going to skip this and I'm going to jump directly to the model. We have a conceptual framework that describes what we think is happening in this context. Um, and the reason why I think there is some usefulness in discussing this is a very simple and stylized uh, model that is sort of very applied to this particular context and is meant to guide our empirical analysis. But even from that, we can derive some predictions that to us at least were not um, um, directly obvious um, and, and they seem to fit what we find empirically. So um, we're thinking of a population that consists of two groups, an in-group and an out-group, share n and one minus n. We can think of the in-group as what I call the natives. It's not very well defined and we, not have, we don't have a, a great way of measuring it either. The census data tells us who is native born of native born parentage and that's as far as we can tell. Um, we, we definitely think of whites and then the out-group uh, in our case, it's going to be the foreign born, at least the way we're going to be measuring it empirically, and later African Americans as well. And um, we're thinking of uh, outgroup members 
um, been characterized by their distance from the in-group. And you can think of this distance in any way you want. It can be a cultural distance. We have some ways of measuring it empirically. They're not perfect. Uh, it could be linguistic distance. It could be religious distance. Um, so by definition, native whites have a zero distance and outgroup members are distributed uh, between zero and H max, where H max is the distance of the most distant outgroup member. Yeah. So uh, in the US census, I know that uh, Arabs, for example, were classified as whites. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Uh, yes, though we don't use the race uh, other than for the, I mean, we can, we can um, identify all immigrants based on the place of birth, and that's what we're going to be using. We do use the race for blacks. I see. So how do you define the rest then? Is anyone who's born in the U.S. and parents born in the U.S. and white? Yeah, so what we have to define empirically actually is not so much the in-group, that's kind of the residual group. It is the other two groups, immigrants and blacks, and that's much better defined in that immigrants are the foreign born, and we define that on the basis of the birthplace, and blacks on the basis of the race. And that uh, generally refers, so native born blacks are essentially African Americans, and that's the group of interest. All the rest is kind of, so that's why I said it's not super well defined in that you can have people of, uh, third generation and um, again I said this is not so much about identification or how people feel as, as you know what we can observe in the census data. Um, okay and then we have this distance that sort of um, for the in-group um, it feeds into a function of what we call perceived distance. Um, that's a function of both how far away these outgroup members are but also of this, uh, does this work, of this H bar that is the distance of the average outgroup member from the in-group. And so the idea is that the, the higher the distance, uh, the higher the perceived distance, the higher in-group members are going to, the, they're going to perceive outgroup members as, as further away. Um, but at the same time, the higher is the average outgroup distance, any given age is going to seem closer. So the intuition behind this is that if you think of, uh, uh, a diverse place with, uh, where this H bar is very high, such as parts of the Bay Area, for example, where one is very likely to meet someone um, different from them in terms of skin tone or the place where they come from, um, then any given person is more likely to seem closer, at least not to surprise us as an outsider or a foreigner. In a place like where I recently moved, which is on the Santa Cruz Mountains, a town that you know, the, the model inhabitant is a white American of retirement age, I look very different to them and, you know, the way in which I dress and when they talk to me they realize that my accent is not exactly American um, and so they're, uh, you know, someone who on the basis of objective distance might be closer seems further away. That's the, the assumption and it's motivated by something that historians of the time have also noticed. So this is Jacobson who's looking at the whitening of immigrants in the US during that time and says that in racial matters above all else, the eye that sees is a means of perception conditioned by the tradition in which its possessor has been reared. An earlier generation of Americans saw Celtic or Mediterranean physiognomies, where today we see only subtly varying shades of a mostly undifferentiated whiteness. So that's exactly the intuition we're trying to capture. So there are two sides to our uh, problem. One is the in-group members, I call them natives, the other is the out-group members. So the other assumption that we make and that I tried to motivate uh, earlier that was actually the case is that natives, there is taste-based discrimination. So the way we model that is that natives face some sort of psychological cost when they interact with an out-group member and they can do something to avoid that. They can engage in discrimination and you can think of that as you know, not interacting with them or not hiring an immigrant because they dislike them. Um, that's a binary action that um, has a cost and you can think of that as a cost of foregone transactions. If I don't hire someone because I don't like them, you know, there is a cost in finding someone else to hire at least that. Um, so the utility of an in-group member is given by this. Uh, essentially, if they engage in discrimination, um, they will have to pay this cost. And, and if they don't, uh, then they're going to suffer the psychological cost, which is a function both of perceived distance. So it's, it's higher, the higher, the further away the outgroup member is perceived to be. And it also depends on, on this E here, which I will explain in a second, and that's what we call um, immigrant assimilation effort. So the idea is that immigrants can do something to reduce the psychological cost. Um, I'll, I'll uh, tell you 
more about that in a second. So essentially, it's just a, a cost-benefit comparison. When the psychological cost uh, is larger than the cost of discrimination, uh, natives are going to engage in discrimination. On the other hand, and this is even the more stylized part of, of our model, is that outgroup members or immigrants um, can do something in order to reduce the psychological cost, which we call assimilation effort. And that, again, you can think of um, anything they can do in order to seem more similar to, uh, to the in-group, and that would be potentially changing their names. That's an outcome that we can actually measure, but it could also be things that we cannot so easily quantify, like uh, you know, changing the way they dress or their habits and trying to appear more American. So what are they trying? What is the problem that they're maximizing? Um, that's very deterministic at this point, but I guess we could uh, make it a bit more interesting. But the idea is that this is an indicator for whether um, immigrants become part of the, the majority. So if they, can, if they exert enough effort, they can be accepted as part of the in-group. Um, that will give them a benefit B, because it's good to be part of the majority. Um, they get access to jobs. They avoid potentially costs of discrimination or harassment. This indicator depends on their distance and on the effort that they put in, and effort comes at a convex cost. Um, so, because I don't have that much time, essentially, we have a binary decision of natives of whether to discriminate or not, and so that naturally gives rise to a threshold of distance, and so, what happens is that there is a distance, H star, such that all outgroup members that are more distant than that, it's going to be too costly for them to exert effort and become assimilated. While those who are closer than that or below that threshold are going to exert the minimum effort needed to assimilate. And then what happens in this context when African Americans arrive? Um, we can operationalize that as an increase in H max. Uh, that's another assumption, essentially. We're saying that African Americans are more distant than all the immigrants who were there at the time. We think it's supported by the historical narrative. And that will raise the threshold. And then I can show you maybe directly in a graph what happens. So this will be the optimal assimilation effort that immigrants will exert as a function of their distance from the in-group. And so you see that um, there is a group, here is the thresh threshold um, H star, or H1 star, the initial threshold. And then everybody who is below this distance is going to exert the minimum effort required to assimilate. Exactly here is where the cost of effort equals the benefit of assimilation. So above that, it becomes too costly to try to assimilate. Um, so immigrants will not exert effort, will not become part of the in-group. What happens when African Americans appear? This threshold is, uh, rises. Um, and so we have here three groups of immigrants, and that's essentially the whole reason why we thought it would be useful to have a model like that, because this is something we can see in the <coughs> empirics. Um, a set of people that were accepted before, um, that exerted assimilation effort that now can essentially become accepted by trying less hard. Uh, then there will be a set of people here between H1 and H2 star um, that did not exert any effort before and will now try and become assimilated. And then there will be a set of people that are still too far away uh, for any assimilation effort to actually lead to assimilation. Yes? No, no, and I don't know, like this is a, something that we have thought of, um, of, of whether um, it should be a function of that and potentially it's something we can think about. At the moment it's like as simple as it gets really. And all we're trying to get at, the reason why I showed you this is because it delivers some implications that are testable in, our, in the context, in the data that we have. The first one is what, you know, I could have said in words without showing you this, which is that in response to the great migration and black inflows, immigrant assimilation increases. The other, which I think is kind of comes out of this uh, simple model, but it's not necessarily easy to understand otherwise, is that this change in assimilation and assimilation effort is nonlinear, and you could see this here. There are some immigrant groups that now have to exert less effort to become part of the in-group. There are some groups that couldn't make it in before but now can, and so we'll actually see more assimilation and more effort for them. And then there are still some groups that remain outside, and that's something that we will also see in the empirics. And then there is one part that is not a prediction, it's an assumption for us that this relative prejudice against immigrants decreases, and we can also do something to show that this is the case. Okay. Yeah, and then there are some parts that are not in the model, but could be. Um, so I think it could be extended in many ways. But part of what constitutes assimilation is essentially adopting um, the racist attitudes of the majority. 
So one way through which immigrants can become American is by becoming racist. And so this is Gunnar Myrdal, um, the, the Swedish economist that wrote like a three volume uh, uh, book on, on the Negro problem in the US in the 40s. And he says that the development of prejudice against Negroes was usually one of the first lessons in Americanization for new immigrants residing in the North. Because they are of low status, they like to have a group like the Negroes to which they can be superior. So I haven't said anything about status. Um, if you're interested in that and our thoughts on that, do ask me if we have time in the end. Uh, um, we, we have done something on this, but it's not part of our, our conceptual framework for a reason. Okay, so let me talk to you about the data. We're using information from the full universe of the census between 1910 and 1930, so the decade essentially right before the onset of the Great Migration and until the end. Um, and we're focusing on 108 um, MSAs, metropolitan statistical areas, that are cities including the suburbs outside the South. Uh, most of what I'll show you is at the individual level, but we do sometimes aggregate at the MSA level, uh, depending on the outcome we're looking at. And then we have a lot of outcomes, some of which I can show results on today, some others we're still collecting or working on. It's not very easy to separate assimilation effort, what the immigrants do, from what happens as an equilibrium. Um, we can get some, some measures that are better proxies of effort than of assimilation, but we acknowledge that you know, we can't really separate the two. We do think that naturalization is something that is more of a choice of immigrants um, rather than a constraint on the part of natives, especially because during this period, um, rejection rates for naturalization petitions were very low, even though not everyone could apply for citizenship, so non-white immigrants were excluded by law. We're looking at some other things that, unfortunately, I don't have results yet, that are both name changes of uh, immigrants themselves, which we can trace from their naturalization papers. We can see the name of the immigrant upon arrival to the US, and then we can see the name that they declare when they petition to become citizens. And then we can look at the names they give to their children. And then we have some measures that are more of equilibrium outcomes. So we look at intermarriage, some economic outcomes like uh, immigrants working in manufacturing and unskilled occupations. We take that to be a measure of assimilation because most immigrants worked in those sectors. So moving out of those sectors is an indicator of becoming more similar to natives. We're looking at home ownership and we have a whole analysis underway on residential segregation patterns and uh, some preliminary results on essentially ethnic segregation going down during this period, even though racial segregation um, increases. Okay, um, what we do is a difference in differences uh, strategy. Yeah? Are you just looking at that first uh, uh, generation of immigrants who have moved to the United States? Are you pulling first, second, third? Yeah, we can do, we don't have information on the third generation. We're now looking only at the foreign born, uh, but we can redo all of this analysis with the uh, no, so, but we can do the analysis separately for the second generation, and that's where our data stops for being able to identify them. So we're essentially comparing uh, metropolitan statistical areas that got uh, uh, more blacks during this period to those that didn't, uh, or we're looking essentially at changes over time holding the MSA um, uh, un, um, time invariant characteristics fixed. What we're worried uh, about, even with this difference in differences context, is that, of course, uh, most African Americans tended to move to places of, that had specific um, economic conditions, potentially those that were doing better during this time, and in which immigrants were also assimilating faster. Um, so the, the way we're trying to solve this problem is by using an IV strategy. Um, and that's where the migration patterns I showed to you earlier are, are coming in. Uh, so we're starting by, we don't actually even have any estimates of how many blacks left the South during this period, so we have to estimate that ourselves using a procedure that I'm going to spare you the details of. Um, and once we have estimated outflows from Southern states, we're going to assign those to Northern MSAs based on how many blacks from each Southern state lived in each Northern MSA in 1900, so before the Great Migration. So this is our instrument. This is going to be the flow um, of uh, African Americans to a Northern MSA and a time T. And that's essentially a weighted average of outflows from all Southern states, uh, uh, from each Southern state J. And the weights will be the shares of immigrants 
from a southern state that, that lived in that northern MSA in 1900. So, and because we're interested in, uh, this is a difference in differences context, so we're interested in the change, and this is a flow, we construct a stock, so we add this uh, over time, and we're looking at the change in this. So the idea behind this is not even that, it has to be that where black settled in 1900 has to be independent of economic conditions during the period and the assimilation of immigrants. That would be too strong an assumption. We can even directly control for shares in 1900, and that doesn't affect our results. It's essentially that, just to take an example, that if in a given year there is more out-migration from, say, Kentucky than from Alabama, that is not because um, those places in which more migrants from Kentucky had moved to in 1900 are growing faster, for example than places where more blacks from Alabama had moved to in 1900. And we can make this even more exogenous, and that's something that we're working on, by just predicting who's going to leave the South based on shocks, the shocks I mentioned before to agriculture. So this is an instrument that's strong. We know that uh, it, it has been used a lot in the immigration literature in other contexts. It, uh, uh, it predicted black inflows correlate very well with the black population. Uh, do I have until like 10 more minutes? Uh, yes. I think, okay. Uh, Okay. Um, so the other thing we're worried about is because most of the action in our data comes from a few big cities, and that's kind of a limitation that we have because that's where blacks move to. And we do a lot of robustness uh, to show that our results uh, are not affected when we drop those big cities. So not everything is driven by New York or Detroit, though it does affect a lot the first stage F statistic of our instrument whether we drop, so we, here we rank MSAs by their 1900 population and then we show the F stat by dropping each of them in turn. Um, and the biggest cities do make a difference, but never a difference that you know, qualitatively alters our conclusions. So I'm going to skip that um, and uh, just going to go directly to the results. So the first thing we want to show is that immigrant assimilation on the basis of those measures that I mentioned increases in response to the Great Migration, and this is what we find. Um, so we find that uh, black inflows, and these are two stage least squares results, uh, increase naturalization rates, intermarriage rates. Um, the share of immigrants who are employed in manufacturing or in uh, unskilled occupations goes down, and the likelihood that immigrants own uh, a house goes up. Um, here we can do a lot more things, so I have a list of boring robustness checks that we can uh, uh, check for. The most important is that there are no pre-trends. These things weren't happening before. Uh, blacks start arriving, it's there again robust to dropping outliers. Um, there is no confounding effect of the immigration quotas that happened in between because that's a concern. If immigrants stop, stop coming in, um, it could be that those who were already in the country start assimilating faster and that could be confounded with the arrival of blacks during the same period, but this is not the case even when we look at before the period of the quotas. Um, another thing we were worried about is that these results come mostly from the fact that the composition of immigrants changes. So as blacks move in, some types of immigrants move out, and so we have the more assimilated uh, potentially stay in. We don't find much evidence of that, so when we look at the effect that black inflows have on the shares of immigrants who come from different European regions, there doesn't seem to be much of an effect on that. We do take these concerns more seriously though, and so we even create a linked panel. So we take immigrants and we track them over time. Um, we use their first and last names, birth years and birthplaces to find them from one census year to the next. Um, and then we can show that most of our results, here we do a lot more with LinkedIn, but um, uh, this is just one linked, linked sample that we create of people who always lived in the same MSA from 1910 to 1930. And all of our results go through apart from the share unskilled, which is, uh, um, doesn't seem to be um, affected when we're looking at the panel, but everything else uh, uh, is pretty much the same as before. Okay, the other thing is that uh, this change in assimilation um, follows this nonlinear pattern with distance. And here, as I said, we don't have a very good way of measuring distance. We're using some of the metrics that um, economists like to use. So one thing that I can show you is that this marginal effect that black inflows have on our main measure of um, uh, assimilation effort at the moment, which is naturalization, uh, follows very well this uh, inverted U shape uh, by a measure of genetic distance. That's essentially um, a distance from um, 
each nationality from the UK. And that's a measure that has been used by Spolauer and Vatsiark, and it's a, a measure of um, elapsed, time elapsed between the time that two populations share the common ancestor. Take it for what it is. We can also use a measure of linguistic distance. Here, this measure is based on how difficult it is for Americans to learn a language other than English, and so it's scored on that basis. In a given number of weeks, I think 12 or uh, 16 weeks, what's the level that an American has reached in, uh, in different languages? And we can show that this is nonlinear by that as well. Um, and then the other thing that we have some um, evidence on is that relative prejudice against immigrants decreases. That's hard to measure. Uh, the way we have to measure, uh, to measure it is using newspaper articles like this one. Distribution of aliens is a big problem for the US. So what's the frequency of articles like that in the press in places where more African Americans went? And so this is something that we're actually doing very systematically using a machine learning uh, approach and a large corpus of uh, historical newspaper text but for now what we have is essentially words that we chose ourselves that kind of indicate concern about immigration. So we can show that um, a higher number of blacks leads to uh, fewer frequency, uh, lower frequency of words like immigration. This is not significant, but uh, words like quotas, exclude, assimilation, this goes up a lot. You know, this could be used in a positive or negative content, a context, it's not clear. If it goes together with all of the rest of the words, it, it, words, it should indicate that um, it's mentioned more positively. And then the two things that seem to respond a lot are Catholic and Catholic threat. Yes? But at the macro level, they actually used quotas, right? During this period, yes. So During our, we are, no, that's entirely true. I mean, this was the peak of concerns about immigration, right? So what we are looking at here is conditioning on that time fixed effect, uh, what happens cross-sectionally when you look at where more versus fewer blacks arrive. And as I said before, this was not even the, the biggest wave of black uh, migration to the north. Um, but well, you can still see... Yeah, it's the cross-sectional yeah, variation. No, that's true, that's true. The time effects is that all of that would be more, essentially. But across, based on how many blacks went, uh, there is this difference. Um, okay, and so, yeah, I said the Catholic threat um, is something that was very much discussed in the context of immigration uh, with respect to Italians and the Poles. Um, but what is interesting is that when we interact this uh, number of blacks with the share of different nationalities in 1910, in the beginning of the period, we see that while there is a drop, or while we see these patterns um, for other groups, and here I take the example of Germany, when we look at places that have um, a higher share of Southern Europeans, for example, or Italians, that seems to be the group that doesn't really assimilate that much. In fact, um, there is no such drop, essentially, in the concern about immigration. So people still are concerned about what happens with the Southern Europeans, um, and that seems to also manifest in their outcomes, because while we can see a lot of assimilation for Northerners, and even for Central and Eastern Europeans, we don't see really that much for Italians. So Italians could be considered as this group that was still sufficiently far for them to not profit from the Great Migration. Okay, I guess I have to, yeah. So there's a bunch of data that we are collecting. And the one thing I want to show is that these are the naturalization data. And so here we can see the name of a person uh, when they file their first papers, the declaration of intention to become a citizen. And then at the time of petition, sometimes these names are different. Sometimes we can see them even at the time of arrival. We're going to use this as a measure of, the closest measure we have to assimilation effort. It's relatively costless to do. Um, yeah, and then we have some other things that are more sort of political uh, channels that could potentially uh, be in, in place. Um, and one thing that we're interested in is how the inflow of um, African Americans into northern cities essentially changed uh, existing political equilibria. So sometimes politicians had incentives to bring immigrants into the white majority. Uh, and they often did that through patronage and directed redistribution. So something that we find is, for example, that the share of immigrants that are working in the public sector, and one such job was policemen, goes up in places where more African Americans went. Um, so I think I'll leave it at that. And essentially, just to say that we think that this is a framework that could potentially be extended to different cases and interactions of multiple groups to show that when a more salient outgroup appears, this may be good for existing outgroups. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>